Let's face it, you've probably written some pretty bad code. And I have too. In fact, we all have. And that's perfectly okay. Part of the learning process of coding is writing bad code. And then even once you get better and better at coding, you will still write bad code. It just becomes a process of learning how to write less and less bad code over time. So what I want to do in this video is share with you five specific criteria points that defines what is good and bad code. And then I'll share with you eight different practical ways that you can actually start writing better code today. So let's start with those five criteria points. First is going to be correctness. And this one should be self-explanatory. If your code doesn't work correctly, it can't be good code. And this also means it needs to properly handle different edge cases. The second criteria point will be readability, which I would define as the combination of expressiveness and conciseness. So expressiveness is how easy it is to understand the intent of your code. And conciseness is how much code there actually is to understand. Now, as a note, readability differs for different people, just like readability of the English language differs for different people. There are many books that are perfectly understandable for their target demographic, but might be harder to understand for someone else. For example, if a first grader tried to read an Ernest Hemingway book, they're probably going to struggle a bit. That's not to say the book was badly written, they just weren't the target demographic for the book. So coming back to code, at a professional level, our target demographic is other software developers. So essentially what we want is for our code to be readable by the most junior developer possible who might be looking at our code. And even better would be if a developer who might not be super well versed in whatever language you're using is still able to understand the general idea of your code. And don't worry too much about this quite yet, we'll look at some specific examples in a moment. The third criteria point is testability. Good code should be testable code, and this usually goes hand in hand with correctness, because in order to verify that code is correct, you usually need to be able to write tests for it. Fourth is maintainability. Your old code should not restrict your ability to write future code. So for example, if a project manager comes up to you with an idea for a new feature for a product you launched a year ago, the code you wrote a year ago shouldn't restrict your ability to write that new feature. Similarly, when it's 2 a.m. and the system fails, your on-call should be able to quickly and safely modify your code if it's necessary to fix whatever outage they might be dealing with. And fifth is going to be performance. Good code is performant code. The faster your code runs, oftentimes the better user experiences you can create and the more money you can save in the form of computing power. That said, performance oftentimes comes with trade-offs in these other areas like readability, so a large part of writing performant code isn't just writing the fastest code possible, it's learning how to balance those trade-offs and when we should be writing more performant code. And now with this criteria in mind, I want to share eight different principles and sort of tricks that you can use to start writing better code today. First is to avoid unnecessary coupling. And coupling is simply the degree of interdependence between multiple modules of code. You've likely heard of the dry principle, meaning don't repeat yourself. And more generally, there's lots of benefits to abstraction. I remember in university, they told us this over and over again. And for the most part, these are good principles to follow. However, it has pitfalls and it cannot be followed blindly as it can just lead to extremely tight and unnecessary coupling. Here's a very simple and basic example. We have two signup functions, one for users and one for administrators. Both have these checks for valid information. So we could refactor this into its own function. After all, it is repeated code. But this code isn't repeated for the same reason. It's just coincidentally repeated. What would happen if, say, administrators need longer passwords? Or maybe administrators need more information, like an address? Well, now we would have to go back to that helper function and special case it for administrators. This defeats the entire purpose of the helper function. And for that reason, it's a bad abstraction. This isn't making the code better, it's just making it harder to maintain. So remember, don't repeat your code, but don't repeat your code for the same reasons. If code is just coincidentally the same, it can be repeated, leave it be. And if code is likely to need to differ in the future, then again, just leave it be and let it be repeated. The origination of the dry principle was in the book, The Pragmatic Programmer, and it stated, every piece of knowledge must have a single, unambiguous, authoritative representation within a system. Note that this does not say code should not repeat. It's about knowledge not being repeated. Knowledge. Good dry code means that if you change some part of the code base, it's not going to have a ripple effect on some other unrelated part of the code base. But if two things are closely related, you should only have to change them in one place. A good test for this is to ask yourself, if a future developer was to change this code, would they know of all of the effects that are going to happen? 
If the answer to that is no, then most likely you have too tight of coupling and you should separate that logic. The next principle or more of a tip is very simple, and that's to do more planning than you ever think you need to do. Most of us have fallen into that trap of just sort of trying to figure it out as we go. And this is not a good approach to coding. Coding is just the process of describing something to a computer. It is the implementation of an idea that you already have defined. If you don't have that idea ahead of time, well, then you've pretty much just skipped a step. That's not to say that you need to have every little aspect of everything planned out ahead of time, because you shouldn't do that. That could be a waste of time. But you should have an idea of what classes you're going to implement, what functions you're going to implement, and how all of these things are going to work together. Then as you code, you can define these smaller implementation details. And while this might sound like a waste of time, what I've actually found is you end up coding faster because the coding part is just sort of writing down your ideas and those ideas are well thought out ahead of time. Next, focus on writing modular code because modular code is testable code. Each piece of code should have a single responsibility and by doing so, it makes that code easy to test. The reason for this is simply that you can write a test to make sure it does this one thing correctly and the tests don't end up bloated or anything like that. And this means that any future developer trying to use your code is going to understand what it does. However, when you start introducing side effects or just multiple responsibilities, the result is tests that get bloated and future developers might not be aware of every little detail of that function or class or whatever it is, and they might end up misusing it. Next, try to avoid deeply nested code. Each level of nesting essentially represents a different path in the code and a different change to the natural flow of the code. And by doing this, it makes your code less expressive and usually also less concise, and as a result, it becomes harder to read. Luckily, if you ever find yourself writing deeply nested code, there's almost always an alternative option that's going to be much more readable. For example, here we have some deeply nested if statements, each containing a large block of code. However, if we invert some of these booleans, we can instead return early using guard clauses, removing the need for this nesting. Alternatively, in this example, we can take this deeply nested code and move it into a helper function. This essentially allows us to reset the level of nesting for that helper function, and with a good name, we can make the code much easier to follow. The next principle is to avoid over-commenting. And really, I would argue that you should almost never write any comments. A comment should be there to describe code that's otherwise not obvious, because otherwise the comment is likely just redundant with the code itself. So therefore, we can say that comments almost always appear by non-readable code. Now, sometimes this is just how things need to be, Sometimes you have some complex logic that just needs to be the way it is. But many times, if you look at this code critically, you can see ways that you can just make the code more expressive and therefore not need the comment. Sometimes this means reworking the logic a little bit. Other times it can just be changing some variable names to make it more clear what everything is doing. A good way to put this is don't comment on bad code. Instead, just write better code. Next, I have a bit of a controversial one for you, and that's that performance just isn't that important most of the time. Performance only matters if it can actually have a meaningful impact on the product. If it doesn't have that meaningful impact, then instead you should focus on other things like readability. This is particularly true with micro-optimizations. If you can make something an order of magnitude faster, well, that probably has a meaningful impact on the actual product. However, micro-optimizations, on the other hand, usually don't have these meaningful impacts. These are things like replacing otherwise good code with less expressive bitwise operations because they're a little bit more efficient, or maybe removing functions altogether because you don't want to have the cost of creating and invoking those functions. There's a time and a place for these micro optimizations, but just understand that most of the time it doesn't matter and it's going to depend on context. Understand the context of how your code is going to run and you can use that context to decide if it actually matters in your specific case. And also realize that many of these micro optimizations can be done automatically by a good compiler anyways, so oftentimes you're just making code less readable to get this same result. For example, this is even function is one I showed in a short. The idea is simple, we don't need all of this nesting. This if condition is a boolean and we return true if it's true, otherwise we return false. That's the same as simply returning the boolean. So the point of the video was that returning just the boolean is more readable as it has the same expressiveness, if not better expressiveness because you don't need to follow the if branches, and it's more concise. Many of the comments, however, began to point out the performance differences because if branches are usually less performant. But in fact, the compiler outputs the exact same thing regardless. Others pointed out that we can use bitwise operations instead of the modulo operator, and it will again become more efficient. But again, a decent compiler will optimize this out and we get the exact same result 
but just with code that's harder to understand as most people aren't very good at reading bitwise code. And now you might be saying, well, not all code is going to be compiled in a way that leads to these micro optimizations. And yes, that is true. However, if you're writing code in a context that doesn't lead to these micro optimizations automatically, most likely you're writing code in a context where the micro optimizations don't matter anyways, and instead you should focus on readability over these micro optimizations in performance. Next, I want to look at some code smells. A code smell is simply an indicator that code might be flawed. And there are many of these, but here's a few of the ones that I think are most important. All variable names should clearly indicate a purpose as well as a type. So for example, the name G would be a very bad variable name because I don't know what it does. However, the name game over would be much better because it tells me that this keeps track of if the game is over or not. But then the name is game over would be even better than that because the is prefix very clearly at first glance indicates that this is going to be a Boolean, which just makes it a little bit easier to read the code. Avoid magic values like magic numbers and magic strings. These are values that appear in your code as just hard-coded values without any explanation for why they're there, and as a result, it can be hard to understand that code, and a future developer might not know what those values actually mean. If a function's parameters keep growing or it's just a very long function, then that function is likely violating the single responsibility principle, meaning it's probably doing too many things. So when this happens, evaluate the function and see if it should be split up. And if you decide it shouldn't be split up, then another thing to do is to look at those parameters and see if they should maybe be an object instead of multiple parameters, because they might be multiple different parts of the same thing. Another way to ensure code maintainability is to properly handle bad inputs. You might know how to use the function you write correctly, but that doesn't mean that somebody two years down the line is also going to understand the intention of the function correctly. And they might try to use it in the wrong way. So to solve for this, handle bad inputs. Some of this can be done with the type system. So use the type system to make sure that the parameters are of the right type. And then you can do some manual error handling as well. So for example, if a function only can take in positive numbers, then you should throw an error if you get a negative number. That said, don't go overboard here either because error handling makes code less concise and therefore usually less readable. So just handle errors in cases that could actually come up and assume that future developers that are using your code are going to be at least somewhat reasonable. And now finally, one last thing you can do is make sure to subscribe for future content if you do like content like this, and I will see you next time.